The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. After Jesus and his disciples arrived in Capernaum, the collectors of the two drachma temple tax came to Peter and asked, doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax? Yes, he does, he replied. When Peter came into the house, Jesus was the first to speak. What do you think, Simon? He asked. From whom do the kings of the earth collect duty and taxes? From their own children or from others? From others, Peter answered. Then the children are exempt, Jesus said to him, but so that we may not cause offense Go and take and throw out your line. Take the first fish you catch, open its mouth, and you will find a four drachma coin. Take it and give it to them for my tax and yours. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. I speak to you in the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Well, as you may have suspected from our scripture readings this morning, I'd like to preach about money. I know you are thrilled. I want to preach about money as it relates to giving. Although I'm going to go ahead and confess that preaching about money is never very comfortable for me. And perhaps the notion of listening to a sermon about money isn't too comfortable for you either. Our society today trains us to be rather private about money. And this tends to carry over even into the church. But also, I'm, I'm sadly pretty confident that many of you may have heard sermons about money and about giving to the church in the past that were unhelpful, perhaps even harmful, inconsistent with the Lord's heart. Whether you've intuited that the preacher was using the pulpit to sort of money grab for the church, or perhaps you've heard sermons where the preachers talked that the 10% tithe is a compulsory obligation that Christians must fulfill if they want to be a faithful Christian or to prove that we're trusting God as our provider or in order to stay in God's good graces. Well, I can go ahead and tell you that is not an idea I intend to promote today. Though I'll need to talk a few minutes longer than usual to get this right, so... Have mercy. I don't want to give the impression that the way we steward our money doesn't matter to God, because it does. But this morning I want to share good news about financial giving by proclaiming that the amount we give to the church has no impact, no impact on God's heart toward us or our standing with him. While local churches like our own rely entirely on parishioner giving for their survival, and giving can be spiritually beneficial in many ways, God invites us to give voluntarily out of love for him and others while he trains us to trust in his provision for what we need. I look forward to unpacking this a bit. I want to begin with our gospel passage. This morning's passage ends up describing one of Jesus' stranger miracles and one that only appears in Matthew's gospel. If it were up to the lectionary that tells us kind of which scriptures to look at each Sunday, we wouldn't even ever read this passage. We wouldn't spend a Sunday looking at it. it has, the lectionary has us skip right on to chapter 18 of Matthew. And yet what Jesus is up to in this passage is actually very relevant 
and important for how we imagine living faithfully before God today in 2023. The passage opens with the collectors of the two drachma temple tax coming to Peter and asking, doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax? Jesus and his disciples had just arrived in Capernaum, which was Jesus' home base as an adult. And so Capernaum's where he would be expected to pay this tax. However, this temple tax was something entirely different from the government taxes that were collected by the notorious and hated tax collectors uh, who collected on behalf of Rome. The temple tax was something very different. It was a religious offering which was expected to be paid once a year by every Jewish male 20 years of age or older. And it paid for the religious services held at the temple and the upkeep of the temple itself. But as we saw in our first lesson this morning, this custom had been commanded by the Lord all the way back in Exodus chapter 30. There God commands that every male 20 and up will pay a half shekel every year. A half shekel was essentially the same as two drachmas. And this money would support the ministry of what at that time of Exodus 30 was the tabernacle, but later became the temple when the temple was built. Now, what's interesting is that you hear a lot also about the tithe in the Bible. Tithe, the word itself, literally means giving 10%, right? So giving 10% of what you have to the Lord. And yet in the Old Testament, God only commands that produce of the land and animals who graze the land be tithed. So while every male paid the temple tax, the ones who were meant to pay the tithe were only the landowners. And this was true even into Jesus' day. The laborers in Jesus' day, like artisans, fishermen, like some of the disciples have been, tradesmen, those who labored and worked the land, did not pay tithes on their income. All that was expected from them was the annual two drachma or half shekel temple tax. And it amounted to about a day and a half's wage for a skilled laborer. A day and a half. The poor were not expected to pay tithes on anything. Now it's funny we don't hear about this a lot in sermons about money, do we? Have you ever heard that in a sermon about money? There's convenient truths sometimes, inconvenient ones. So that's the background of this question posed to Peter in verse 24. The temple tax collectors ask Peter if Jesus pays the temple tax. And you've got to understand that for somebody like Peter, paying the temple tax was just assumed for all males 20 and over, right? So Peter replies to the collectors, yes, of course Jesus pays the tax. But when Peter and Jesus are together in the house, Jesus has something new to teach him. Jesus asks, what do you think, Simon, Simon Peter, from whom do the kings of the earth collect duty and taxes, from their own children or from others? Now, the point Jesus is making is that earthly kings don't tax their own families. Right? They tax everybody else, only their subjects. So when Peter correctly answers, from others, they tax others, Jesus concludes, then the children are exempt, aren't they? Now what does this mean? What's Jesus getting at? Well, Jesus is explaining to Peter why he, Jesus, as the Son of God, is actually not obligated to pay the temple tax. Why? Because it is the temple of his own father. Okay? Okay? But that's not all. The implication of Jesus' statement is not only is he exempt, but that all of the children of God are exempt. The children are exempt, he says. Now remember that throughout the New Testament, including in Galatians 3 that Nan read for us today, we're taught that through faith in Christ, we have been adopted into the family of God as God's children. 
So the implication is that for those who are in Christ, giving financially in support of the religious services of what it's today, the church, is not compulsory like it was with the two drachma tax of leading up to Jesus' time. And this begins to make even more sense when we look back at the Exodus passage for a moment and notice that God has called this two drachma or half shekel tax. This tax God instituted, he called atonement money. Did you catch that? Atonement money? In verse 16, God says, Receive the atonement money from the Israelites and use it for the service of the tent of meeting. It will be a memorial for the Israelites before the Lord, making atonement for your lives. Well, atonement refers to what reconciles us to God for our sins. That's what atonement is. It's what gives us reconciliation with God for our sins. So God required this annual offering from his people for the forgiveness of their sins under the law. And so in Judaism, paying the temple tax was part of receiving God's forgiveness. But in Jesus... All of this has changed. Because for those of us who place our trust in Jesus, forgiveness comes what? Only through Him and what He has done. Well, I think this is really important for us to hear today. Because I'm going to bet that quite a few of us, even if we don't think consciously that our standing with God is based on whether we give or how much we give, a lot of us may feel in our bones, feel like what we give or don't give could impact how God feels toward us. I won't ask for a show of hands. I know I've carried that in my bones. But the good news is that the amount we give to the church has no impact on God's heart toward us or our standing with Him. While local churches rely, like ours at least, rely entirely on parishioner giving for our survival, and giving can be spiritually beneficial in many ways, God invites us to give voluntarily out of love for Him and others while He trains us to trust in His provision for what we need. So Jesus is not under obligation from God to pay this temple tax. And as a follower of Jesus, neither is Peter. I know Jesus hadn't died on the cross yet, but there's some murky stuff in that little time period. And yet, so they're not obligated. And yet, as our Matthew passage continues, we see that Jesus ends up paying the temple tax voluntarily and miraculously too. And he pays it for both himself and Peter. After telling Peter that they're exempt from this temple tax, Jesus tells Peter in verse 27, But so that we may not cause offense, go to the lake and throw out your line. Take the first fish you catch, open its mouth, and you will find a four drachma coin. Take it and give it to them for my tax and yours. Wow. Wow. What Jesus is saying is that even though he and Peter are not obliged to pay the temple tax, he's going to do it anyway. And the reason he's going to do it, he's going to do it miraculously, no less, the reason is for love. See, because the Jews in those days had no clue Jesus was actually the Son of God, and they had no clue about what he'd just been teaching Peter, Jesus doesn't want to create a stumbling block or an additional stumbling block to them believing in him. If they, you know, hear when, get wind that he doesn't even pay the tax that all males 20 and up are supposed to. And so after ruling out compulsory giving for those who are in Christ, Jesus provides a new motivation for giving for those who are in Christ. And that motivation is love. And in our context today, giving to the church is a way we can show love to God and our neighbor. It's one way, right? Not the only way, of course. But practically speaking, right, every local church has to have money to run, 
In fact, I've learned that this very church during the Great Depression had to shutter its doors for quite a few years due to just lack of funds. And it, I think that was pretty common during that time. Therefore, even though the giving of church offerings has no bearing on God's heart toward us or our standing with Him, giving is an opportunity to love God and others, right? If we believe that, that everything we have is a gift from God, then one way we can show love and give thanks is by giving, you know, love for God and thanks to Him is by giving a portion of it back. Also, though, if we believe the local church is God's primary instrument for making disciples, then we are loving others when we support its ministry. Heck, we're loving ourselves, right? In a good way, right? Having said all that, though, having said that giving in Christ is not compulsory but a voluntary act of love, I would be remiss if I didn't insist that giving financially to the church is not always loving. Say that again. Giving to the church is not always the loving thing to do, the loving decision. Indeed, there can be instances where giving to the church is an unloving way to steward the funds we have. And so pastorally, I would discourage it if given the opportunity. For example, one situation where it's not loving to give to the church is when a married person wants to give but their spouse is not on board with it. And we're talking about money that's under both of their authority, I guess I should say. This might happen when one person in a marriage is a believer and the other's not. Or they might both be believers, but they're just in different places regarding what amount they believe is, would be best to give. In such situations... If the one who wants to give more were to insist upon it, the risk here would be to give the one who doesn't want to give or give as much. The risk would be causing them to take offense against the church or against Christ. So that's one instance where pastorally I would discourage giving. But even more important than that, another situation where giving to the church is not the most loving decision is when giving to the church would be at the expense of one's own needs or the needs of those under their care. This is one reason I'm especially down on the teaching that the tithe is universally compulsory. Think about it. Well, and Jesus, or sorry, God seemed to see this in the Old Testament when only the landowners tithed. Giving 10% is going to impact the one who has very little a lot more than it's going to impact the one who has plenty or a lot. That's just the way it is. That's just the math, right? So when God insisted that only the landowners in the Old Testament would tithe from produce of the land, that actually created a much more equitable society than the neighboring nations where tithing was compulsory and normal. So when the church teaches that giving is universally compulsory or that the tithe of 10% is, I believe that it is spiritually abusive and harmful to many to teach that. And I say that as somebody who's taught it before, but I guess I'm repenting, right? And I've, I've been repenting of that for, God, I preached on this passage six years ago. I know one story that's often used in support of kind of compulsory giving is that of the widow's mite. Are you all familiar with this story from, from Mark 12 and Luke 21 where Jesus sees, Jesus and the disciples see the, this woman, this widow, put in the only two copper coins she has. Lord knows how many sermons this has been used in a spiritually abusive manner, to be really honest. Right? Many commonly interpret this passage as an example of this woman's great faith, and perhaps it is, but often that is emphasized while at the same time missing the way Jesus is critiquing that temple leadership will be more focused on filling their coffers than caring for the poor. 
that they would even allow this woman to give that much. Her only two coins left. It's immoral. Now, I'm glad that more and more are interpreting the passage in that way these days. So in regard to deciding how much to give for us, one needs to weigh the top priority of their own needs and those under their care, and then consider how much is best and loving to give to the church or those less fortunate from what's left over. And here at St. Matthias, we try to explain what the financial needs of the church are so that people can do that in an even more informed way. Every year at our stewardship drive, which will be later in the fall, we try to kind of give a picture of what the needs are, what this giving could or couldn't go toward, that sort of thing. And certainly, if nobody gave significantly, the church could get into financial trouble pretty fast. But this parish has always given generously has always been responsive toward needs that have arisen. And the Lord's provided. But the decision of whether to give, how much to give, is a voluntary decision based on love for God and others, not fear about how God's going to feel about it or what's going to happen to me if I don't. Those are some distorted images of the Lord as revealed in Christ. So if one wants to commit to the tithe, to giving 10%, that's a voluntary decision. And for example, for Amanda and I, we choose to do that, right? But we also have a stable income, and 90% of, of that income is able to fully meet our needs and the needs of those under our care. So we're in a situation where we believe that fulfilling a 10% tithe to the church is what's the most loving decision. But Everybody's in different situations. The good news is that the amount that anyone gives to the church has no impact on God's heart toward them or their standing with Him. While local churches rely entirely on parishioner giving for their survival and giving can be of spiritual benefit in many ways, God invites us to give voluntarily out of love for Him and others while He trains us to trust in His provision for what we need. Well, the last element from today's passage I want to highlight is how Jesus goes about paying the temple tax that he's decided to. Through the miracle of a coin in a fish's mouth. A fish that Peter catches at Jesus' instruction. Now, this might seem odd. Like, Jesus could have done this miracle in all sorts of different ways. But he chooses to put a coin in a fish's mouth that Peter goes and catches. And I want to suggest that what this points to is how God intends to be our provider. Everything we have is a gift from God. And elsewhere, Jesus teaches us to seek his kingdom first and he'll provide for our physical needs. But as you well know, God doesn't just zap our bank accounts. Instead, he's given us varying abilities and energy, not to mention varying levels of privilege and opportunity for, in most of our cases, to earn a living. And so it's likely no accident, then, that Jesus chooses to provide this coin by having Peter fish for it, since you will remember that fishing was Peter's trade. P fishing was his skill. So Peter goes and fishes, right? He goes and does the fishing, and yet God is still the miraculous provider. You see how, how Jesus has built that paradox into the miracle. It's really cool. And so taking it back to us, where giving to the church is not going to be unloving to others or prevent needs from being met, there are many ways that giving can be spiritually beneficial to us. Not only can it be an opportunity to love God, but to learn reliance upon him, to reject the lie of mammon 
of wealth accrual that rules the world today and to experience joy. So I just want to talk through those before I close briefly. So similar to fasting, right, there's a lot of mentalities about fasting, but I think that a healthy and holy way to think about fasting is we abstain from food that, so that God can then supernaturally sustain us and give us strength for that period of time. It's a way to train ourselves to rely upon him and to learn his character experientially. Similarly, giving sacrificially can provide an opportunity for us to learn experientially that God is our provider. In a world that constantly says, no, you're your provider. It's all up to you. Like that coin in the fish's mouth, I've found that the Lord has provided for my needs while I've given sacrificially. Granted, I don't think I've always given for good motives, right? I think it's sometimes it's been out of fear. That's another story. But, but because I've experienced that for so long, God's provision, it's not too hard for me to believe then that God will continue doing it in the future, come what may, for me and my family, right? So it's one thing to believe stuff up here in our heads. I believe God's my provider. It's another thing to have the opportunity to learn experientially. That's where the truths really get in our heart and a muscle memory of how we live and how we make decisions. So that's one, one thing, one spiritual benefit of sacrificial giving. But also, it's also similar to taking a Sabbath, Right? When we take a Sabbath, again, a lot of mentality is about that too, but taking a Sabbath is a way for us to, to live out the belief that there is more to life than our work, that our worth is not in our work, which again, our society constantly says, work, 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 and your worth is in your work, right? Similar to that, similar to Sabbath, Giving away from our treasure is a way for us to say that, that life is not actually about money. Like, money's necessary, but life's not about money or the accrual of it. And finally, giving to God's an opportunity for us to experience joy. It's quite joyful to realize that God wants to provide for our needs and that our worth isn't in what we do or in how we perform, and to believe those things deeply enough to be able to act on them. It's a joyful experience to honor God for all his goodness toward us by giving something back to him. And finally, it's a joyful thing when we're able to give of ourselves for the benefit of others. Right? As Jesus taught, it's better to give than receive. The good news is the amount we give to the church has no impact on God's heart toward us or our standing with him. While local churches may rely entirely on parishioner giving for their survival and giving can have spiritual benefits in many ways, God invites us to give voluntarily out of love for him and others while he trains us to trust in his provision for what we need. And so I just want to say, kind of in closing, two things. First, if you feel like you have a lot of baggage around money, which I'm going to say the majority of humans do, maybe you carry with you an image of God who expects you to tithe at all costs, or, or maybe you just know money's a real idol for you. Or maybe you just feel unclear about what God would have you do and how to sort of make these decisions. And you're confused about which way is up. Or if this sermon has been like a total curveball that has your head spinning, I just invite you to come talk to me. Let's work through it a little bit. Let's talk through it. I'm not going to tell you what to do. Try to ask some constructive questions. But my, secondly, my prayer is that with any fear of God's anger or disappointment kind of off the table at least if you believe what I've said today. And having no reason to fear that God would lead us to do anything that would harm us, that would be for our harm, 
My prayer is that we'll all be able to ask God how he's inviting us to steward what he's given us in love for him and others. And then just be able to be at peace. That whatever he says is enough. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.